Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to one of the uh, first sessions here at the uh, Battle of Ideas 2014, Hunger in the UK, the Food Banks Phenomenon. Uh, my name is Justine Bryan. I'm the uh, National Coordinator of the Institute of Ideas Debating Matters competition. Uh, and they've very kindly invited me to chair this session because he knows I've got an interest in this subject. So very pleased to be here this morning. Um, I suspect most of you, like me, uh, weren't really aware of food banks uh, until the last two or three years or so, uh, whereas now they seem completely ubiquitous in any discussion about contemporary British society. Uh, of course, I'm not surprised there are charity endeavours to help those in need. There always have been, uh, either run by churches or communities. Um, but today, I think the term food banks become a kind of shorthand for a much broader discussion uh, about a number of things, possibly about the failings of capitalist society, uh, the consequence of government cuts, and perhaps more broadly about the state of the nation, uh, uh, an example of broken Britain, uh, which for those of you who may have followed the debate around Scottish independence as nerdily as I did, will know that broken Britain became a, a, a kind of stick with which to beat Westminster, the Tories, and existing politics more broadly. Uh, is an example of their values versus ours. So uh, I, I think the food banks discussion very much fits into that discussion of broken Britain. But there has been a very real rise in food banks in the UK from the Trussell Trust 2 back in 2004 to over 400 to date. That's that figure representing an estimated third of food banks nationally. So is it really the case that we're going hungry today in a way we weren't a decade ago? Our families really harder off than they were before. Uh, is there a greater demand for these services, or as some controversially suggest, is this simply a reflection of people making use of greater supply rather than there being a greater demand? And what role do food banks serve uh, in relation to the broader welfare state? Should we approve of the voluntary uh, charity sector over centralised welfare, uh, or do food banks represent a shift of responsibility and care from the state to the community, and what do we think of that? Is that necessarily a bad thing? There are lots and lots of strands that come out in the food uh, uh, banks debate, some of which we're going to look at today, uh, and they're quite diverse and varied. So without further ado, let's meet our panel of um, speakers. Very pleased to welcome on my right here Dave Clements. He's a public servant with more than 15 years experience working in local government uh, and charity and care sectors in policy management project uh, uh, and management roles, engagement roles, sorry. Uh, he's author of The Future of Community, Reports of a Death Greatly Exaggerated. He blogs regularly for the Huffington Post, uh, and he convenes the Institute of Ideas Social Policy Forum, which is the partner uh, and producer of this debate today. So welcome to Dave. Dave's going to be speaking first. Um, speaking next is Adrian Curtis here on my left. He's the network director of the Trussell Trust Food Banks. Formerly in the banking industry, uh, Adrian established the first Trussell Trust Food Bank in Wales in 2008, and there are now 35 of them. Demand for food banks, uh, he says, has soared since the economic crisis began, and his organisation last year provided food for over 916,000 people in crisis, which he argues uh, must be a wake-up call to the nation. Next to speak, uh, uh, pleased to welcome Hannah Lambie-Mumford. She's a researcher in food poverty at the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Sheffield. Her research focuses on food poverty, the arise of emergency food provision, and the right to food. Most recently, she was involved in the defra funded review of food aid and has given both written and oral evidence to the parliamentary inquiry into hunger and food poverty. So welcome to Hannah. Uh, and speaking last, but by no means least, we have Robin Aiken uh, on my far right here. He's co-founder of Oxford Food Bank. He's also a former BBC reporter, uh, which he left after 25 years to write a book uh, entitled Can We Trust the BBC, which he was critical, where he was critical of what he argued was a liberal left bias in the corporation. Oxford Food Bank gathers surplus foods from supermarkets and wholesalers and last year gave over a million pounds worth of food to charities and individuals. But Robin's been critical of both the public debate about food banks uh, because of its unscrupulous use of statistics and what he thinks is the over-politicised nature of the debate. So those are our four panellists this morning. Without further ado, I'm going to invite Dave Clements to kick us off with his thoughts. Each speaker is going to speak for about five to seven minutes uh, then we'll open it up to dialogue between the panel and then we'll bring it out to you, the audience, as quickly as we can. So, Dave, over to you. Thank you, Justine. Um, so how do we account for the rise of the food bank? I think there are a number of answers to that question. But my first answer would be that food banks have become a vehicle for a variety of interests and a variety of prejudices um, that are commonly held at the moment. First of all, I think there are 
quite snobbish attitudes about the food poor people eat. There's a, a certain uh, dislike of the modern food manufacturing process, a dislike of supermarkets. Uh, the medical profession, the, the BMJ and the Lancet being perhaps the, the best examples, have been very keen to um, look at the kinds of food people eat, to look at things like obesity, um, to look at the rich sugary food that people eat, and to problematize that. Um, so that, while it has very little to do with food banks, has, be, has contextualized the debate, I think. And so the BMJ, or rather the Lancet, has called for a 20% sugary food tax. Um, I'm not sure that helps with food poverty, but those are the kind of prejudices that are out there, I think, in terms of uh, some of the arguments that are being used. There are also greenish arguments about sustainability and about the wastefulness of the supermarkets in particular, which I think is a, a slightly strange argument as far as um, there's actually that's, the fact that there is wastefulness suggests that there's actual abundance of food in the system and that perhaps a certain amount of waste can be uh, allowed for and is perhaps inevitable. But also the supermarkets actually play quite an integral role in the food bank industry. Uh, I think the, the Tesco say they have provided 53 million meals for um, the Trussell Trust and for a fair share which distributes food uh, to other food banks across the country. There are also what I'd describe as uh, leftish sentiments uh, about the cruelties of the government's austerity policies, particularly around welfare. And I think there's a kind of a, a faux radicalism which is often used um, uh, that attaches itself to the food banks debate, where it's counterposed with inequality, with bankers' bonuses, with politicians um, spending too much in the, in the bar at the House of the Commons. There's a, a certain uh, focus on the, uh, the fact that food banks aren't the, aren't the answer to the problem, they're a sticking plaster, which may be true, but I think there's a, the tendency is to actually undermine people's sense of their individual agency. Um, there's a tendency to portray food bank users as passive victims, um, uh, unable to do anything against the forces of neoliberalism and capitalism. So those are the kind of vehicles, or those are the kind of ideas around which food banks are being used as a vehicle, I would argue. Now, there is a real problem. I do acknowledge that people are hard up. Uh, prices have been on the rise um, for, for reasons to do with the world economy around oil prices, drought, um, the demand that's been generated by India and China, the, the growing economies. There's been a, a stagnation of wages, and they've fallen in real terms over the last few years. Um, the Trussell Trust will tell you that a third of the people using food, their food banks have a low income, they've lost their job, or they've lost their home, or they're uh, in a lot of debt. The welfare system is also a major problem, so it's well documented by the Trussell Trust, I'm sure Adrian will say more about this, that uh, sanctions are being used in the benefit system in such a way that a lot of people um, are being denied benefits, rightly or wrongly. There are also a lot of delays in the payments of benefits. I think it's something like 17% of the um, vouchers that people are being issued for Trussell Trust food banks are down to delays in benefits. There are also the welfare reforms. There have been a number of reforms, but in particular, the benefit cap, which uh, says that if you're out of work, you shouldn't earn more than if you were in work, which seems fair enough, but there may be arguments about the rights and wrongs of the way that's calculated. The bedroom tax, um, uh, which is the removal of the spare room subsidy for people who are living in public housing, um, a very controversial um, welfare change that is also uh, having an impact. But I think where the debate really gets interesting is around the outsourcing of the responsibility for welfare and the responsibility for uh, welfare assistance. So the government has uh, abolished the social fund, which was a centralised system of providing welfare assistance through a, a system of crisis loans. That's been abolished and replaced with a devolved system, whereby local authorities are given a less generous uh, amount of money to run local welfare schemes, which, uh, which vary depending on where you live. Now, I would argue that's a problem, and as far as the, um, the charitable support and the in-kind support that people might receive has been sucked in to the welfare state. Effectively, the Trussell Trust has become a part of that. It's part of this extended state of uh, welfare support. 
But I'll go even further than that. The, the, the outsourcing of responsibility for welfare even goes down to the individual level. So those people who I talked about before as having a leftish or faux radical uh, position on food banks, they also outsource responsibility for the individuals themselves. So I think there is a case to be made for individuals perhaps having difficulties um, around their own ability to cope with the situation. So I, I think that there may be a case that, that the right tends to make that um, there are cultural or moral failings, that people aren't looking for work or that people aren't genuinely hunger, hungry. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I think there's a case to be made for it. And I think, like I say, that's where it gets interesting. And this is, uh, you may know that the, the theme of the conference is uh, the crisis of judgments. And I think these are where the sorts of judgments that people need, need, that we need to make around food banks need, need to be actually taken on and acknowledged and actually um, where we need to be honest about this. I think we need to look at some of these issues. So there's been a, a, a very easy dismissal, I think, of certain criticisms of the food bank movements, which we should perhaps take a little, a little more seriously. So we have um, Lord Freud, the welfare minister, who's recently been, been in the news for um, his views on the minimum wage and uh, whether people with disabilities uh, deserve it. Um, I don't have any sympathy for that view, but he also talked a lot about food banks, and his view of food banks is that they, uh, they are, as I would put it, like mountains are to mountaineers. Um, food banks uh, are there, therefore people visit them. And there are more of them, so therefore people will use them. Now, I don't have a, a great deal of uh, sympathy for the argument, but I think, again, inevitably, as more food banks are generated, people will use them. And it actually does raise a question, because a lot of the arguments made around food banks are that they are, um, the people who use them feel shameful, feel embarrassed. Um, there's a certain taboo around using food banks. But if there are these you know, 400 plus in the Trussell Trust, there are over a thousand in the country, the numbers using them has increased from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands over the past three or four years, then do all of those people really feel that embarrassed? I think there's, there's a question that we need to ask about that. Uh, and also need to ask a question about the, the, what I would call the real Freudian problem here, which is um, that food banks increasingly talk about providing more than food. I think that's a term used by the Trussell Trust in particular. I think there's a danger that people get sucked into other areas of support and therapy, as I would call it, um, with help with their mental health problems as much as anything else. So I think we need to ask some difficult questions. Um, and I think, um, as Claire Fox put in her essay um, that accompanies this festival, we need to seek deeper truths beyond the political cliches and the political opportunism that we've uh, witnessed around this subject. Um, and also, we need to look at um, the broader picture and perhaps not rely on the statistics for our arguments um, as much as we have. Dave, thank you very much. OK, so from Dave to Adrian, representing the Trussell Trust, so over to you. Thank you very much. So, yes, I'm Adrian Curtis. I'm the National Food Bank Director for the Trussell Trust. Um, the Trussell Trust is a charity whose vision is to challenge poverty where we see it, to meet a need and to see ultimately people's lives transformed as a result of meeting that need. In the UK, we meet a need through our network of around 1,200 food bank centres that operate through churches and community halls across the UK. Our food bank supplies short-term emergency food to individuals and families who find themselves in a sudden unexpected crisis where they have no access to money to go to the supermarket and to buy food for a short period of time. Rather than market food banks through a clever marketing team, we respond to communities who approach us because they've seen a need in their community and they would like us to help them set up a food bank to be able to meet that need. Each client that is supported by a food bank is referred by a network of around 20,000 frontline care professional organisations. These are health visitors, social workers, GPs, the police, um, and many charities uh, who work with vulnerable people um, who find themselves in a variety um, of different crises. Those organisations address the root cause of the crisis, some of the underlying problems that has caused that person to be in that predicament where they can't afford to be able to put food on the table for a short period of time. The emergency food provided by our network of food banks 
takes the pressure away from that family to allow the freedom for that organisation to address the cause. Over the past few years, as many of you will be familiar with, we've seen a huge increase in the volume of people who have been referred to us in genuine need. That increase has been disproportionate to the number of new food banks that we've opened. Last year, for example, we saw 163% more people referred to Trussell Trust food banks across the UK, whilst we only opened 40% more projects. That led to 913,000 people um, needing emergency food provision. This year, we've actually seen a dramatic slowdown in the numbers of new projects we have opened. We're now only opening one project every month, compared to three a week last year. Yet the numbers of clients referred to us continues to increase. So what's caused the increase? What is causing more people to be referred to us? Well, we take our statistics from those 20,000 organisations who tell us why they've referred that person in need. And those organisations tell us that, you know, rising cost of living, food, fuel, um, has increased dramatically over the last 10 years, whilst people's salaries have tended to stagnate, or in some cases fall, as people move to less sustainable forms of employment. This has put a squeeze on people's disposable income, making it more likely that they enter into a crisis when rainy times arrive and it's difficult for them to juggle between paying bills every month and putting food on the table. In addition to this, around 40% of our referrals um, were because of problems with the welfare system. This includes delays to welfare claims being processed, sudden changes to the level of welfare that somebody receives, and sanctions when somebody receives no welfare at all for a period of time. We've been accused over the last um, couple of years in particular of being um, a political charity. We are an apolitical charity and we certainly try to avoid at all costs engaging in any debate on party politics. We try and tell our clients' stories to policymakers so that they can make policies work more efficiently and better for those who need to use food banks. The 913,000 people that we fed last year were real people, real families in the UK. There were people such as Charlotte, a 21-year-old full-time student who was not eligible for welfare payments. When she arrived at the food bank centre, Charlotte had been eating toilet paper to be able to uh, stop herself feeling hungry and was in the first stage of malnutrition. Our clients were people like Suzanne, a hard-working mum who suddenly lost her job along with her partner at the same time. When Suzanne was at the food bank centre, she told us that she was no longer able to breastfeed a baby because she was malnourished and unable to produce breast milk. We help people such as Lieutenant McChrystal, who left at active duty in the army having suffered post-traumatic <coughs> stress disorder and arrived at one of our food banks in London with no shoes, desperate and in need of help and a friend. For these people, food banks are a lifeline at their time of crisis. We believe stories such as these are absolutely unacceptable in 2014 in the UK. And so we want to tell these stories to encourage policymakers of all parties to be able to understand the reasons why so many people are finding themselves in a sudden short-term crisis and need help from our um, 1,400 food bank centres. We are proud to speak up for people in crisis and it's an absolute privilege to be their voice. We want to help our food banks this year deliver more than food, as Dave was saying. We've partnered with Martin Lewis, the money-saving expert, to be able to put adv financial advisors into our food bank center so that we can help, together with our 20,000 partner agencies, address some of the causes of the crisis whilst the client is in the food bank center. We hope, eventually, this will lead to less people needing to use food banks. We're one of those organizations that's in a strange position where we kind of want to do ourselves out of work. In an ideal world, there would be no needs for food banks to exist. But whenever that need does exist, we will continue to be there to offer that lifeline to those who find themselves in such a desperate need. And we will continue to challenge poverty where we see it. We'll continue to meet the very real need that we see in communities across the UK and hopefully we'll begin to see more lives transformed through our work. Thank you.
Adrian, thank you very much. Okay, Hannah, your thoughts on this issue? Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name's Hannah from the University of Sheffield, and I'm doing a number of uh, pieces of work around the growth of emergency food aid, but also wider experiences of food poverty and the right to food as well. And I would just like to spend my five minutes talking about four particular issues. The first that I'd like to pose for us all to think about this morning is the idea that these food bank statistics are just the tip of the iceberg. So what these numbers tell us, and particularly the fact that we rely so heavily on one organisation's numbers, the Trussell Trust, is how many people or how much, how much help was given to people in food crisis uh, who, from a Trussell Trust food bank. They don't tell us anything about the people in equal need who didn't, for whatever reason, access a food bank. They also don't tell us anything about the people who are experiencing lesser, but by no means less real, hunger or food poverty. I would actually argue that these, these statistics are telling us something much more. One of the big issues that we face and a number of other uh, countries face is the fact that we don't measure hunger or food poverty or food security, however you want to uh, talk about it, systematically in this country. So we have no proper data which tells us how many people are going hungry in, in this country. But what we do know is what the structural causes of hunger are, and we have information on how some of those have changed over the last few years, particularly since the recession. So all we need to do is look at DEFRA's own statistics, which tell us that since uh, the early 2000s, food has got 20% less affordable for the poorest 10% of people in this country. We also only need to turn to minimum income standards research, which tells us that between 2008-9 to 2011-12, the proportion of people that were living on an income below minimum income standards has risen by a fifth. So I would argue, therefore, that we can say that something very real is happening in terms of hunger in this country. And when put together with information that lots of organisations are telling us about food crisis, I think we need to really start looking carefully at it. The second point I want to make is the fact that hunger, food poverty, food insecurity is about much more than food. Okay? And I think this is really, really important, particularly in a setting, on a, in a session entitled Hunger and Food Banks. I think it's really important that we look at the first part of it rather than focus completely on the really important work that's being done in communities to respond and meet urgent need. We need to look further back and upstream. One of the consequences of predominant emphasis on food charity in other countries, such as Canada and the US and elsewhere in Europe, is that it can start, the, the issue of hunger can start to be framed as one of food. So one solved by the provision of or education about food. If we just teach people how to budget better or how to cook, then they'll be fine. Or, and if that doesn't work, we'll give them a parcel of food. We need to ask deep questions about our food system. So we're not talk, just talking about the distribution of income, we're also talking about the distribution of food and how it works across the globe as well. So I think really importantly, we need to look at the layer above food charity. And lots of people talk about people falling through the gaps and going through the, back, the doors of food banks. So what are these gaps and how do we plug them? Urgently, we need to look at prevention rather than necessarily just talking about different ways of providing relief. The third question is one that's already sort of been raised um, by Dave before. But it's the questions that food banks raise for what our welfare system looks like. But I think there's a question of what we want it to look like. So increasingly, we're seeing food banks taking more and more responsibility for hunger in the face of a lack of coordinated response at government level. I'd argue this is symptomatic of neoliberal social policy and increasing emphasis on individualised risk and responsibility. We should absolutely celebrate these charities for the amount of compassion and care that they provide to people in, uh, in their local communities. But again, we need to look at prevention. Lastly, I want to raise this question, and it's another issue that's, that was raised in the, in the guidance for this, for this talk. But it's also this, this question of acceptability. So this idea that people don't mind, they're just hop, hop into a food bank, no big deal. Um, and also this question people raise about people being dependent on food banks. And I actually want to reframe these issues of acceptability and dependency and ask for who is this becoming acceptable and who is becoming dependent on them. And I would argue that as this, this phenomena goes onwards and gets bigger, that actually it's society that thinks it's more acceptable and that it's society that's more dependent on food charity to solve these problems. Thanks. Hannah, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Robin. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, good of you to turn out at this time to hear a debate like this. Um, I want to challenge some of the assumptions around the debate about food banks. And I must preface my remarks by saying that I'm speaking on my own behalf, not on behalf of the Oxford Food Bank, of which I am a co-founder. I suppose, in Hannah's view, I would be an agent of the neoliberal social policy. I come from a tradition of, well, I say a tradition, I mean my own personal tradition, is that of being on the right of politics. So how come is it that I ended up founding a food bank in Oxford? Um, well, I think that uh, the first thing that we should do is challenge cliche number one. I have read in the newspapers a hundred times over the past couple of years what a mark of shame it is that we have food banks in Britain. In my view, that's complete nonsense, and it puts sense on its head. The fact is that it would be a far greater mark of shame were we not to have food banks. Food banks are a practical, easy way of providing charity to those less fortunate than ourselves. And it's worth noting that every major world religion enjoins its followers uh, to give food to the poor. There is nothing new about food charity. It's as old as human society. It's always been there. Hopefully it always will be there because it's a sign that people care about each other. The second cliche I want to lay is this idea that in some way we are in the middle of a food poverty crisis. Cliché number one is the very phrase itself, food poverty. There's no such thing as food poverty. There is poverty. I'm old enough to know that poverty has been in Britain throughout my lifetime. I started my work as a journalist in the black country back in the 1970s. And I can assure you that poverty in Walsall in 1973 was at a level which outstrips anything you would see anywhere in Britain today. However, in 1970s Walsall, there were no food banks, um, and people found other ways to get around the problem of poverty. Much is made of the fact that there has been this explosion in the rise of food banks, their numbers and uh, the number of people accessing them. There are two reasons for that in my view. One is the innate, good-natured, charitable instinct of the British people who see a practical way of alleviating other people's distress. The other thing is that they have become enormously fashionable and enormously publicized. It's been difficult at times to turn on the radio or television or open a newspaper without reading about newspapers. Consequently, the idea of food banks is out there in the ether and people have latched onto it Adrian makes note of the fact that referrals to Trussell Trust food banks have gone up tremendously. Well, of course they have, because how many social workers 10 years ago would have known about a food bank? None. There were no food banks. Clearly, you can't refer to institutions that don't exist. I have a problem about the debate about food banks because I think that it's become co-opted into a general debate about welfare reform. And people have pointed the finger at the government and said, you're cutting back on welfare, and food banks are having to take up the slack. Actually, there's a danger for food banks and the food bank movement in all that. Um, we, the Oxford Food Bank, that is, are a strictly a political organization. We have people, we have 100 volunteers um, of all political persuasions. I think it does food banks no good whatsoever to be roped in on the side of the argument which says that welfare reform is an evil thing forcing more people into poverty. That merely polarizes the argument and actually will turn some people off helping out with food banks. The main thing I wanted to tell you here this morning is this, and I want to refer now to the, the, the model of the Oxford Food Bank because it's a rather different animal from the Trussell Trust food banks. Um, we are a sustainable food bank. And I put this simple equation to you here. We talk about food poverty in this country. How much food 
is wasted every day in this country. Tons, hundreds of tons, thousands of tons. It's reckoned that 11 million tons of food are wasted every year in Britain. We all waste food in our homes. The Oxford Food Bank is an attempt to solve that problem. We solve the problem of people in need of good food by collecting food from supermarkets and wholesalers and giving it to charities. We serve 60 charities. We gave away a million pounds worth of food last year. We have 100 active volunteers. We've got a depot. We've got a three vans. And we're entirely voluntary. We started from nothing five years ago. And what we have shown is that in a community the size of Oxford, you can gather and distribute a million pounds worth of food aid from a standing start on a budget of about 25,000 pounds a year. Now, in all this talk about food banks and uh, particularly the model of the food banks which you'll be most familiar with, with, which is the Trussell Trust, think about this. The Trussell Trust food banks, and I have great admiration for what the Trussell Trust does, and for the people who work in the Trussell Trust. I think they do an excellent job. But it cannot be denied that what they do is mainly handle store cupboard groceries. These are bought from supermarkets and delivered to people in need. The very same supermarkets from which the goods which Trussell Trust super, uh, food banks uh, use to, to help people, the very same supermarkets every day are throwing out the back door crates of fresh food. Uh, which go to landfill or to, or to uh, anaerobic digestion. It's a mad system when we're all sitting here worrying about people in need of good food, and at the same time, society cannot organize itself properly to take that food, the surplus food in the waste chain, and give it to people in need, thus cutting out the need for people, you know, for the, those slightly less, you know, those slightly better off to buy food to give to those who are slightly worse off. My time is up, but uh, <laughs> thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Panelists, thank you very much. Um, I want to give you all an opportunity to challenge one another, because uh, you clearly don't all agree, but I wonder if I could just kick off with a few questions. Um, Hannah, just based on the fact Robin spoke last, uh, Robin's suggesting there's no such thing as the very thing you're researching at Sheffield. It doesn't exist, food poverty. Yeah, okay. Sounds like a good place to start, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> goes really to the, to the heart of a big dilemma, I think, that, that researchers in this field face. And it's one about how we talk about it, but also how, what's the most helpful way to talk about it? Because the second point I made was one about this isn't a food problem. So you might say, oh, well, you can say that, but then you're going around talking about food poverty. So by definition, surely you're part of that problem or you know, may, may kind of bring about that consequence. But what I think is that, that food has been a crucial part in how we define poverty and has been a crucial part of the experience of poverty ever since anyone's ever researched poverty. So food is an integral aspect to the experience and definition of, of poverty. But also there are key, it's not just about income, it's also about the structure of our food system, as I said. So I think really the concept of food poverty has a really practic helpful practical application for policymakers as well, because it's saying well, this, is, this is a bigger issue. This is also about what do our local communities look like? What food can people access? What responsibility does the food industry have to make sure to help and make sure that poor people can access adequate healthy food? So I think it has a real practical application. Um, and also we can uh, extrapolate it out into kind of human rights theories as well. So I think it enables us to, but it also really importantly enables us to take part, uh, take account of how food has a has a really important place in how we take part in society, how it can facilitate social exclusion, um, the experiences of, of not being able to send your child to school with a lunchbox like everybody else, not being able to invite your friends around for a, for, a t for dinner, not, not feeling able to invite your child's friends around for dinner and um, send your child out to someone's house for dinner for fear that you won't be able to invite them back and the implications that would have. So I think it helps us to think a little bit more broadly about the role of food in people's lives as well. Hannah, thanks. Um, Adrian, you talked yeah. about poor families juggling paying food yeah. and bills. I suspect that's always been the case. 
uh, uh, families have always had to make those choices. Why the Dave's suggesting there's been a change in kind of social and moral norms, which means yeah. we now turn to methods we never used to, such as food banks. Well, I mean, I, I would challenge some of the things that's been said. I would agree also with quite a lot of what's been said. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, the things to do with um, people budgeting and um, the difficulties that people have faced, I, I would argue that um, we may not be in the middle of a food poverty crisis in the way that some people are polarising it as, but I would certainly say that we've seen a significant increase in need, particularly over the last two years. Um, what I didn't mention in my talk was that, you know, Trussell Trust food banks have been around for over 10 years. So um, many of our food banks were established um, in, in the late 90s. Um, and those food banks have seen a significant increase over the last two years. Whereas before that, the levels of people they were feeding was relatively consistent. So I, I would um, argue that it's not just that more referrers suddenly know about us that didn't know about us before, because those referrers have been partnering with some of our food banks for over 10 years. Um, I, I would also say that, you know, um, the fact that um, Trussell Trust food bank models may be le less sustainable, I would again uh, challenge that assumption um, based on the fact that, um, you know, we rely on communities sharing um, their uh, th their resources, um, buying food to be able to support and help feed their hungry neighbour. And that is an incredibly sustainable way um, to be able to challenge poverty and to meet a need in the community. And in fact, as Robin said, you know, churches and religious communities have been doing this for many hundreds of years, um, which shows how sustainable that model really is. Um, but over the last two years, I would say we have seen an increase in need. We, um, you know, it's not just us saying this. You look at Citizens Advice Bureau, Joseph Rowntree, and many other organisations who are reporting exactly the same trend in need. We're not reporting anything that's inconsistent with what um, thousands of other charities are reporting across the UK. Um, and I believe that although it wasn't acceptable 10 years ago to see uh, people come into food banks, that, that we, were, we were campaigning then um, and talking to policymakers about the way um, in which the welfare system was working not that efficiently for people who need to use it. Um, and we will continue to do that now. It's not about party politics. This is about real people and a real need. Dave, there is a real need. Uh, no problem with food banks. I don't necessarily have a problem with food banks. Um, we were talking earlier in the green room about how this debate can often be um, caricatured as are you for or against food banks? Um, I, I'm neither really. You know, if there's a need for them, then clearly there's a need for them. Um, I think part of the problem, um, which is the opposite of the problem that's often described, is that there isn't enough politics in this debate. What people tend to say is that oh, there's too much politics. I think both Robin and Adrian have, have been keen to stress that they are apolitical or their charities are apolitical. I think part of the problem with this debate is that it's very data heavy. It's very driven by particularly the Trussell Trust statistics. To their credit, they keep statistics, and that, that helps to some extent. But people tend to kind of use that to fit uh, ready-made arguments about welfare. Um, uh, and I don't think that's particularly helpful. I think we need to look a bit deeper than that. Um, there's a, a remarkable amount of um, assumed certainty about what the causes of the problem are when that's despite the fact that, as Hannah says, there's no proper data actually been generated, at least in the UK. So I think we need to kind of be a, bit, a little more humble and actually stand back a bit and actually look at what's going on here. There is nevertheless a lot of talk about root causes, uh, and Adrian talks about root causes, but then he went on to, as, as Hannah said, to, to actually not really get, get into what those causes might be, but to individualise the problem. So the fact that they're giving out financial advice the fact that food banks are uh, helping people with mental health problems, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very uh, conservative response, really. It's, it's very therapeutic. It doesn't get at the root causes at all. Um, so I, I, and I think that's, that's, that's what's happening with the, with the focus on food as well. I think it's a very emotive um, subject to talk about starving children, which is what they do. There was a Daily Mirror stock photo used uh, a few months ago you know, trying to uh, illustrate the problem of food poverty. Um, when clearly this was a photo of a child from Canada who had nothing to do with the food poverty problem. But there is that kind of tendency to, to, to use that, the, the idea of the child and, and food and hunger as a way of trying to get people's uh, attention, and it works. So I think that's a problem. But what the point I was making is not, is not so much about the economics of this issue, but about what's happened in society, what's changed in our culture. And the point of this idea that people um, feel shameful and embarrassed about using food banks, despite the fact that loads of people are using them apparently, 
I think that we need to answer that question. What, what, what is it? What's changed in society? What is it about the way people relate to each other, relate to the state, the way they relate to their families and their communities that means that they're no longer relying on them, but they are using food banks? What, what's happened? What's changed? Robin, do you see the Oxford Food Bank as an extension of the state? Uh, no, of course not. And actually, we have been um, absolutely scrupulous in accepting no money from statutory sources whatsoever. I feel there is an absolute value in having organisations which are of their community, serving their community, paid for by their community. And I think that it's good for the state to butt out of that kind of initiative. Um, one or two things, uh, if I may just make a, a sure. quick couple of points. You know, Dave says, what's the root cause of what's happening? The root cause of what's happening is poverty. And, uh, you know, I put it to you. Has there been, since the dawn of human existence, any society without poverty? Of course there hasn't. I mean, it's blindingly obvious, isn't it? That poverty is just a fact of life. We, as fellow citizens of those who are poor, must do our bit to help those people. I mean, there's no, you know, this is not, <laughs> this is surely uh, not a revolutionary statement. It's just a statement of the blindingly obvious. And, you know, this phrase, food poverty, it's a cant phrase. It's a cant phrase. Because sticking food onto poverty makes it seem as if there's a special category of poverty. That ain't so. If you're poor, you might have to choose between buying a cinema ticket or buying a new pair of shoes or maybe doing without either of those things and buying food. That's what poverty is. It's a question of having not enough money to do all those things which are necessary. That's poverty. It's not food poverty. It's just plain, old-fashioned, vanilla-flavoured poverty. Robin, thank you. Panel, before I go out to the audience, is there anything any of you would particularly like to come back on burning in your mind? Um, the sub subject of food poverty, I would agree with what Robin just, just said. I mean, uh, food banks, I mean, it's, it's such an emotive thing. I, I just comment on what Dave said about the Daily Mirror. That, that wasn't us that put that out. That was the Daily Mi Mirror that put that out. And unfortunately, we, we don't have editorial control over the press, unfortunately. I wish we did sometimes, to be honest. But um, with, with, what, um, with what Robin was saying, um, I mean, our food banks are there to support people in crisis. The people who come to our food banks are experiencing a crisis um, which is why they have no money to be able to go to the supermarket and buy food. Now, sometimes longer-term poverty issues um, are under the surface that's making it more likely that people enter into a crisis. But I think it is an important distinction to make that, you know, we respond to a very sudden, urgent crisis. In fact, most of our clients who visit our food banks just need that one intervention, that one food voucher, and the signposting and emotional support they receive in the food bank centre connects them with the right organisations to resolve what's causing the crisis at the time. But clearly, um, you know, poverty is an issue that affects communities, and some of the poorer communities, it's more likely that people are going to find themselves in a crisis. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks. There's just a just a, a couple of things. First of all, I think there's uh, a definitional issue in terms of what we're talking about. We're talking about our food banks part of the welfare state. Well, I'd say, well, maybe we need to talk about welfare systems rather than welfare state. Um, because the state implies the state is having some role or, or taking some responsibility in this or they're becoming part of how the state operates. Because actually, I think what we're facing is, is, a, is actually a changing nature of our welfare systems in local communities. So I think maybe there's a terminology issue there. Uh, Dave mentioned that um, the rise in people turning to food banks uh, indicates that people aren't relying on their families or other support mechanisms. I would actually uh, refute that based on the work we did for DEFRA, which shows very clearly that people will try all kinds of things before they go to a food bank. And often they are getting as much help as they can, maybe from family and friends. But you, you may well be talking about people in community who everyone is suffering. So five years ago, they may well have been able to send their children to grandma for three, three dinners a week. And now grandma's having a tough time. So now they all have to go to the food bank. Um, I think um, Robert and I will have to agree to disagree on the uh, conceptualisation of food poverty. But I think while he was saying the point he was making about there's no society without poverty, well, whilst that's not a revolutionary 
comment, I find it an exceptionally depressing statement. And I think there is no way or no reason why we should just accept it. I think we should strive to um, actually prevent it and overcome it. And the fact that we're having to rely increasingly on charities to do that, I think, is something that we need to sit back and think about. OK, Dave, quickly, before I bring the audience in. OK, I think... Robin said something about the state butting out of food banks, or it should be butting out of food banks, and Hannah talks about this not being a problem of the state as such, but about welfare systems and how, and how we should change it. Um, I, I think, as, we, as I said before, I used the term extended state. Charity has been sucked into the, to the welfare state and has been turned into something else entirely. Um, the Citizens Advice Bureau gives out vouchers for food. It gave out 100,000 vouchers last year. And then it does. It gives those vouchers to organisations like the Trussell Trust. Now, both of these are formerly charities, but they're they're completely part of the state system of providing welfare assistance. So I you know I think that's a problem, and and, and I think that, that that that's what I was, that's the point I was trying to make um, on this idea that people first rely on their own resources and then turn to food banks. I think that's true to an extent, but I'm, I'm, what I'm questioning is. The, the evidence that we have now about the, the massive increase in the use of food banks in this country, and there isn't much research in this country, over the very recent period of three or four years, doesn't back that up. If people are relying on their own resources, they don't immediately turn to food banks, as has happened in the past few years. OK, I'm going to go out to the audience. There are lots of people frowning and nodding and shaking their heads. Yes, I'm Trevor Fisher, and I am a historian, and uh, I see social history. And one of the things we talked about was the fact that poverty has always existed, no question about that. And charity has always existed. But looking at the history of, the, um, of England in the 19th and 20th centuries, you have a, a pattern. And the pattern was extreme poverty in the Industrial Revolution. By the middle 19th century, rising living standards. And poverty went off the agenda. Came back into the agenda in the 1880s, and particularly in the east end of London. I mean, if you look at Dr. Bernardo, his experience, you know, a child actually dying, um, uh, why he has the famous slogan, no destitute child is ever refused admission, is because a child actually froze to death. Uh, you have the Booth and Roundtree survey, the National Joseph Roundtree Foundation, that's where the Joseph Roundtree people come from. And Booth was a conservative. I mean, Booth actually believed in laissez-faire. And then he did his surveys in London and discovered there's a whole realm of people there who, whatever happens, cannot possibly survive. And you have real destitution. And if anybody really wants to go to the literature side of this, Jack London's book, The People of the Abyss, where he comes into London, an American a journalist and writer, goes out along the commercial road, and my God, what he found was not poverty, it is destitution. Then you get the development of the, um, the welfare state. And you have the Lloyd George government in 1906. And by the 1930s, you have certain rudimentary things. But then you find people like Richard Hoggard looking back in the 30s and saying, what you have is family poverty, and it's the poverty of the mother. Because if you're short of, of, of food and money, the breadwinner must get the, 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 uh, the lion's share of the, the budget. The kids come second, the working class mother comes third. During the Second World War, when we were short of food, and I accept all the arguments about uh, food waste, there was no food waste in the Second World War, for God's sake, the Germans made damn sure of that with their U boats. But we actually had a rising standard of living for the working class. So when the 45 government comes along, the working class are saying, we ain't going back to the 1930s, and then we all think, well, the state is there. It can't be removed. Well, recently we were going back to laissez-faire, and with laissez-faire you'd expect poverty and food poverty destitution to re-emerge. That's what's happening. That's the pattern. Thank you very much. You're asking what, what has changed in the last few years. I live locally, and... Um, in my church, people use food banks. And two things that I've found uh, with them, one is the growth of scratch cards. I found this is a terrible curse, that they often will buy 20 quid's worth of scratch cards and then they have no money for food. The other thing is um, uh, people bringing up children. Um, we have this awful, I think it's an awful thing, called um, breakfast clubs, which kind of give the idea to people that the state will provide everything. So even putting some cereal in a bowl for your child, that is taken out of the hands of people. And I just find that working class people are kind of being sort of um, used as, um, I think we're used as fodder for uh, middle class people to for jobs. Uh, I think that we've got all these graduates who we don't know what to do with. So we think we'll have two classes of people, one who people need help and others who are going to help them. And I find that absolutely disgusting. Um, and I think people should, we should try to encourage people to say, 
it is your responsibility. And as for um, people have always taken free food. I was at a reception the other day, very posh reception, and they were giving out free drinks. And believe me, people were nearly killing themselves to get these free drinks. <laughs> <laughs> these were the top people in society. Um, and when my mother died some years ago, um, we actually had to break down her door of her larder where she'd stuffed it with this bad free EEC food some years ago. Um, and another little story is my children went to local schools and they were always told they were not on free school meals and they were always told, you, your parents are mugs because you are not on free school meals. Okay. So that's just some little um, anecdotes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just challenge the comparative that, that Robin made, that obviously having food banks providing food to people that need it is better than those food banks not existing and those people going hungry. But presumably the accurate comparison would be not needing those food banks would be better than having those food banks, right? So the noble aim of any legitimate charity, in my opinion, should be its eventual non-existence. Okay. So Cancer Research UK, for example, is aiming at cancer not existing in the future and therefore Cancer Research UK not needing to exist. And so presumably the noble aim of food banks as a whole should be its eventual non-existence for food poverty not to be an issue or poverty that requires food to not be an issue. I'm currently an A-level student and our school is situated in one of the most defi uh, deprived areas in Shadwell and um, there's a lot of issue in our school about uh, fuel poverty so uh, we conducted a research to find out how real fuel poverty is and the results we got were well scary really and, and I agree with Hannah how people go to a far extent to solve the problem themselves before they go to food banks. For example, one of the students, um, like in our culture, we have a lot of rice and curry. Our diet is based around that. But it is quite expensive, so people resort to going to PFCs where you get one pound milk box, which is really unhealthy. Whereas other students would find that their house was crowded because their sisters, brothers, and their families would come to their house and depend on them. And they weren't able to like, ed uh, like learn or anything like that. And as a result, we thought um, more, enough people are not going to the food banks. And maybe food banks are not the only way to go about it. Because in our school, we've got a breakfast club. And those things actually do help. Because students, the meal that they miss out the most is breakfast. And when government or welfare system provides the funding for that, and it helps them provide food. OK. Hi, uh, my name is Bradley. I'm a student. Um, I'd just like to go back to what you were saying. You kind of saying poverty will always exist. Um, that's probably depressingly true. But if there are systemic problems in our society that can at least alleviate it slightly, I feel like we have a duty to act on that. Um, and I think the weight of evidence suggests that issues around um, minimum wage, cost of living, welfare reforms really just suggest that they are, if not completely causing it, at least compounding the issue. And I feel like we have a duty to act on that. Well, first of all, if I can pick up your point there. Um, look, I've spent the last five years working hard in a food bank in Oxford to uh, help people who are in need of help. Uh, I don't think that um, one cannot make a sensible argument against food banks. Food banks are a good, wholesome, expression of charitable concern about our fellow citizens, and they're to be applauded in that regard. But there are certain, there are certain caveats here. The gentleman over there, the, the social historian, was saying that you know, we're moving back to a laissez-faire system, uh, and therefore that's why poverty levels are rising, or at least I think that's what I take to be the burden of, of what you said, sir. So. Looking at the welfare bill for the country, if this is laissez-faire, uh, you could have fooled me. <laughs> because we have a panoply of social provision which covers virtually every aspect of human life from birth to death. And the state is involved in most people's lives at nearly every stage of their lives. That's not laissez-faire. And the fact that there may well, and I don't deny the fact, actually, incidentally, I think there has been a rise in people in critical need over the past couple of years. But this, remember, is, may just be a transient fluctuation 
um, in that level of need, which may well in a couple of years evaporate. The final point I want to make is that the lady here at the front in, who, who was talking about her own experience of people buying 20 pounds scratch cards. Look, however benevolent the state, however determined the state and the rest of us are to try to help those in poverty, people who budget unwisely, who spend money on non-essentials rather than essentials, these people will never be helped. You will never eradicate that kind of poverty. How can you help? How can you help you know, somebody who, who has 20 quid in their pockets and buys a scratch card rather than buying breakfast for her children? I mean, <laughs> you know, we, we cannot be protected always from the consequences of our own folly. Thank you, Robin. Dave. Thank you. Um, I'd agree with uh, Robin on the uh, point made by the historian. I, I, I don't believe that we live in a, a laissez-faire um, uh, society or that the state plays a, less, a lesser role today than it did in the past. I think the opposite is true. I think uh, that that's evidence both in terms of interventions in the economy with welfare spending is continuing to rise. Um, and also uh, in terms of the interventions in society, which the, the food banks uh, issue kind of demonstrates, uh, as I've, and as I've explained in relation to charities being sucked into the state, it's quite a, it's quite a, uh, it's quite hungry for, for more and more influence. So I, I wouldn't agree with that. I disagree with um, Robin when it comes to this notion of poverty as a fact of life. As a, a bit of an old lefty, I think it's a problem that can be solved, and it often has uh, social causes and and, and, and well, where. Come on, give me the example. Which is the society? Give me the example of the society in the world, now, currently, or at any time throughout history, which has eradicated poverty. I wasn't claiming that any society had eradicated poverty. <laughs> I, was, I was simply saying that I believe the causes of it are not natural, that they don't um, exist um, for all time in the same way, that, but the, the nature of the society as it exists does generate certain... Um, dynamics and poverty is one of them. That's the argument I'm making. Okay. If, on, on a second. But at the same time, what I, th what I, what I think you actually, ironically enough, end up doing, you're sounding like a bit of an old lefty yourself. When you, when you talk about collective solutions and um, redistribution. Re re oh, no, let, me, let, me, let, me finish, let me finish my point. <laughs> and you end up, what you're arguing for is redistribution of food abundantly provided by the uh, supermarkets, however wasteful they may be. Um, at two food banks. Now, that's a pretty kind of socialist sounding solution to me. I'm all for it myself. That, that's good, great. I'm all for it. I, I don't have any criticisms of what you're saying in, in relation to that. I, I, actually, I find myself in a slightly uncomfortable position in as far as I recognise what the woman's saying at the front here in relation to, uh, it was a great quote, I might use it myself. Um, you talked about working class people being used by middle class people as fodder and dividing society into the, into the helped and they're helping, which is, which is exactly what's going on, I think. I, find, I feel uncomfortable about it as, a bit of, as a, an ex-working class person, now probably middle class, working in the public sector and doing that kind of thing. So you're absolutely right. Um, it was interesting that one of the arguments um, that have been made recently around food banks is that children are coming in hungry um, from, uh, from their summer holidays or their, uh, when the breakfast clubs aren't open, which is, is odd because the breakfast clubs didn't exist until about 10, 15 years ago on any, any sort of scale. So a provision has come, up, has come on tap and, and has been um, like food banks and, and has been described as necessary, even though it never existed a few years ago. So I, I think you're absolutely right there. Okay, minor existential crisis for Dover uh, about his current state. Uh, Robin, I will bring you back in, I promise, but Hannah and Adrian are keen to come back as well. So, so Hannah. Yeah, okay. Well, I think, I think the point that Ed made about not needing them is, is really critical for me. I think, and as I said, with my, with my, my, the first point I raised is this idea of looking at the level above to what gaps are people falling through, uh, what, and looking to the structural causes and how we might address them. I think the way in which Robin reacted to that is, is really is important thing I think I'd really want to pick up on. And that's to say that to say that we shouldn't need them is not inherently to criticise them. I think that's really, really important. And to say they shouldn't exist isn't the same thing as saying they're doing a bad job at what they're doing and, and that we should disregard the efforts that go into them. I would like that to be very clear. I think 
that, as I say, that relates to a wider sort of uh, structural issues, which leads on to the, the comment made from the, the lady from Chadwell, which I think is, again, I've brought them up a couple of times and I, I want to keep bringing them up, and that's the food industry and what you were saying about cheap, cheap, unhealthy food as well. And we need to hold them to account as much as we're holding anybody else to account. And that goes for the food waste question as well. You know, we need to be asking about distributional justice of food as well as income and really, really getting into that, I think. And I think that relates to another, well, the other point I wanted just to make from the really interesting work you were doing, I'd love to talk to you more at the end if that's all right. But you made a comment about um, other ways of helping people with food and uh, breakfast clubs. And to me, that, that brought up an issue of, of access and, and whether questions of effectiveness relate particularly to access. So obviously with breakfast clubs, people, children can go, if they're eligible, they can go and, and they can reach as many school children as, as need it, hopefully, depending on how, how much food they've got to go around. But I think that is one thing we really need to pay attention to, is how accessible some of these projects are. You know, these projects are only able to do what they're able to do, and they're not an entitlement. There's no kind of guaranteed access, so they will be missing people in need. So are there other ways of thinking about it? as well. And I just wanted to lightly touch on, on the point that um, the historian made around the intra-household poverty and the experience of women. And I think that will be being seen increasingly in the current situation that we're in here. And I think it's something that we need to look at more and more. Thanks, Anna. Adrian. Thank you. I'll pick up on a, on a, on a couple of points. Um, I mean, I think you're dead right in saying that throughout history, we have seen times when we've seen, unfortunately, an increase in poverty, an increase in child poverty. And we seem to go through cycles. We seem to be making progress. And then suddenly, that the progress is reversed. It's incredibly frustrating. And I think although, uh, as Robin said, you know, food, uh, poverty, unfortunately, has always been with us. And unfortunately, it probably will always be with us. But I believe, you know, we should be making every effort to try and um, reduce the numbers of people who are finding themselves in poverty. Um, I, I absolutely believe that to be the case. With regards to the comments about, you know, uh, breakfast clubs and, and things like this, I mean, I like to pay tribute, you know, to Kids Company and to Make Lunch and lots of other projects that are supplying breakfast clubs um, to people in need. And although it doesn't solve all of their food needs, breakfast clubs serve a very different purpose. It provides a social environment for families to meet together before school starts. It provides, make sure that every child has a breakfast so that their attention in class um, is that much better and gives them a better opportunity. Um, we see in our food banks, for example, in the school holidays, a significant increase in the summer in clients referred to us. And um, some research we conducted with Kellogg's recently found that um, you, you know, a significant per percentage of teachers, I think it was one in eight teachers, if I remember rightly, report that they see children in their class um, whose attention span is less after the summer holidays simply because they haven't been eating breakfast um, and haven't been eating well. So, um, you know, these, these projects do, they're not the answer to everything, but they do supply, you know, a very valuable service in communities. Uh, food banks shouldn't exist. I totally agree. It would be fantastic if there was a world when food banks didn't exist. It would be fantastic if there was a world where poverty doesn't exist. But being a realist, um, to eliminate the need for food banks, we would have to address every issue, every referral reason why people are coming to us. Debt issues, relationship breakdown, domestic violence. You know, unfortunately, these things will be part of society in the future. Um, and we have to make sure that when somebody is in a sudden unexpected crisis, that there is help immediately available. And unfortunately, with the means-tested welfare system, it is going to take time to assess eligibility for state support um, and during that time, that's not quick enough for some people. Some people need that emergency response um, to their crisis that they're in. And that's where food banks can step in and help. So we've asked, uh, Dave, you've been talking about uh, social institutions and what's happened in our society. And uh, why has food banks rapidly risen in the last uh, few years? Well, there's been a lot of breakdown in our society, hasn't there? So, for example, institutions like uh, relationships, Marriage is less and less of a big thing. Relationships are a lot more fluid. The family unit is not nuclear anymore. We've had a fall in uh, community-based things. So, for example, church attendance has rapidly fallen. And so these institutions which people have relied on in the past no longer are present. And so maybe that's why people all of a sudden are having to go outside of the remit of their friends, of their local institutions, towards other things things like food banks, maybe the real reason is because our society is 
completely changed from what we actually used to have. David, a doctoral student at the University of Oxford, a lot of you have been quite against the state getting involved in food banks. Um, and I would argue that as it's becoming clear that welfare, the welfare state as it exists at the moment is unsustainable with our current budgets, wouldn't it be a, isn't it, wouldn't it be a good thing for the government to get involved in food banks? Isn't it just going to be as gaps appear in the welfare system that the government cannot pay for, giving money towards food banks, isn't that going to be filling in some of the gaps, helping some of these people that otherwise would get help from the government who now no longer will? As I was just going to put that to you, sort of as, isn't it isn't a good thing for the government to get involved in? Thank you. I wasn't going to intervene, but but uh, I've been uh, stimulated to do so. Um, <laughs> First of all, I declare an interest. I'm a former member of two parliaments for different parties. I'm steadily moving to the left. left. I'm probably on the way to being a Marxist. But I started as a Conservative and then became a Liberal Democrat and Scottish Party. I was a Conservative in Westminster. Can I just say, you know, we've got to be very careful. I'll, I'll never vote Conservative again. Uh, and precisely because of the economic policies now. I mean, we've got this paradoxical situation where... Uh, unemployment is going down, but of course so are living standards, the squeeze on incomes. And we've only seen the beginning of that because we're less than 50% through the cuts. So, um, and what I'm particularly concerned about is exactly what you said, um, sorry, Adrian. Um, and that is all these other areas that come into consideration. Now, I live in Kensington. Now, before anybody hisses, there are two bits of Kensington, and the north part is extremely deprived. Um, it's solidly Labour, and quite rightly so. I vote Labour, probably will next time. Anyway, the point about it is that we're seeing the tri bar experiment in West London. This is anecdotal and important. And we're seeing the three local authorities, Kensington, Chelsea, Westminster, Hammersmith and Fulham, Basically, tri bar experiment is a multi-syllable uh, phrase for cuts. Uh, that's what it is. And, you know, the issue of addiction, and we are talking about scratch cards, and that I, it's an issue in which I was very involved in politics. And we're talking about scratch cards and numerous forms of addiction. Gambling is one of them. And we've got a situation now where addiction treatment has been way cut back despite the supposed interest in the subject by both the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. Treatment centres are being closed. People aren't getting into treatment. The substance use team in my area, for example, facing huge cuts. And it's a knock-on effect. We're seeing treatment centres down in Western Supermare as a result being uh, closed down, teams broken up, we've had good, uh, you know, good track record. All I'm saying is that the, the old adage, as a one-nation Tory, which I was, not a Thatcher, a one-nation Tory, is, you know, a, a net below which none can fall, a ladder up which all can climb, that's going. You know, it is more laissez-faire than it used to be. And don't anybody be deluded. Okay. Well, I think food banks is indeed a very appealing concept because it's so simple, so basic, so emotive, so straightforward. Here is a poor, hungry person. I have some food. I can feed them. Very simple response. And I think we're all craving the simple, basic, primitive responses. And also, I think, and it's nice, there's nothing wrong with it, but I don't think it really goes to the essence of the problem because food is ridiculously cheap in this country. I'm working around the world. I know... You know, kind of, I can compare the prices relative to the income, it's really cheap. There is no reason any parent cannot make a breakfast to the child. There is something else going on. Or people are so depressed that they're giving up on themselves and their children, or people just can't be bothered to that kind of level and they think that somebody else will indeed pick this up. So I don't think we know how to really empower people and how to engage with them. And we mock, you know. Jamie Oliver quite often and we don't take him seriously, but I think he's at least tried in a way to get to this kind of understanding and engaging with people like what is really going on? You know, you have the money. Why don't or you have the access to the resources? Why can't you be bothered doing these things? And again, maybe not blaming them necessarily, not kind of reprimanding them, but trying to understand what can really empower people and kind of get them back into action and into being more resilient and doing things for themselves. Very much. We're going to come back to the panel. Who, Adrian, you jump first. You okay, go. there we are. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, interestingly, we have food banks in Chelsea, in in in, in uh, Kensington, Hammersmith, and Fulham. We, you know, unfortunately, we, we are finding people in crisis uh, across um, every community in the UK. 
Um, and um, we have certainly seen an increase, certainly seen an increase in the last two years in those uh, people who've been referred to us because there's less support available. You know, that's why we're trying to put more advice into our food bank centres because advice centres are closing down. People have nowhere else to turn. Um, and um, I don't want to just pick, paint a picture of doom and gloom because, um, you know, food banks do give hope to people. So it, they're not all a bad thing. Um, you know, people, when they come to our food bank, are in desperate need of support. They feel like sometimes they've been treated like a number where they've been before, and over a warm drink with some of our volunteers, they open up and tell us their entire life story. And that helps us signpost them and get them plugged in to the help that they, they really need. Um, I wanted to go back to a point that I wanted to make last time and I forgot, but it, it was the idea of some people um, who are uh, the people who are helped and some people are the people who help others, and there's like two categories in society. Well, it's interesting in food banks, many of our volunteers, those who help, are ex-clients. Um, you know, uh, most of our food banks work um, with, with people who are not professionals, who are not middle-class people giving food um, to working-class people. It is, um, many of our food banks operate with, with a dedicated team of, we've worked around 30,000 volunteers, and many of those are ex-clients, people who've been helped by the food bank, and they want to share their experience and use it to help others. And um, the, the, the point about, you know, church attendance declining and, and, you know, community hubs disappearing, it's clear that people are um, relying on each other in a very different way to how they did uh, 50 years ago. That is true. Our social networks have changed quite significantly. But it is an interesting point that, you know, most of our food banks, in fact, um, all of our food banks are church-led initiatives. Um, so it's great to see churches, uh, you know, it goes to the heart of their faith and their beliefs, and that drives an awful lot of people to want to make a real difference in the lives of others. The lady at the front disagrees with you, but you're going to have to, you'll take that with him over tea, I think. Uh, Robin, over to you. Yeah, um, a few points. Um, to the gentleman in the front here who was talking about, um, you know, the, the idea of getting the state involved in the running of food banks. From our, our own experience, our, uh, the Oxford Food Bank does, in voluntary hours, the equivalent of 10 full-time job equivalents per week. So that's a lot of money. You know, the point is that, that with an expanding welfare bill, volunteerism is an essential ingredient of a healthy society. Getting people to volunteer not only makes them feel better about themselves and helps their local community, it's an essential ingredient of a free civic society. And the idea that the state should embrace every, every charitable enterprise is wholly mistaken, and I believe very damaging to the ethos of charities themselves. Um, the second thing I want to say is that I just want to reiterate this point. The amount of food wasted in Britain dwarfs the amount of food given away by food banks dwarfs it. I don't know what the figure is, but I would think a hundred times more food is wasted than is given away by food banks. Now, surely that raises a question mark in your mind about how to organize society so that instead of wasting food, we give it to people in need. Is this not just a blindingly obvious conclusion? And the last thing I wanted to say is that often in these discussions, in my experience, we get the left-right debate. And it often, usually it seems to me, that, that, that left thought on these matters takes flight and leaves reality far behind. That obviously eradicating poverty is a great idea. And I would love to live in a society where poverty was eradicated. But I am a sufficient of a realist to think that I'm never going to live in that society, not until I pass over into the, the other side. And uh, I don't think anyone else should be under the illusion that we can eradicate poverty. What we can do as individuals is make a contribution to the alleviation of those people who will be always in poverty in our society. Thanks, Robin. Dave? Uh, two broad points um, relating to some of the questions that have been asked. First of all, somebody said, uh, isn't it right that the state should be involved, given that there's need there? Um, shouldn't it involve itself? Well, I, I think that's a problem in as far as um, some of the comments that Adrian was making kind of make me nervous. 
So uh, the Shuttle Trust and other charity um, organisations are a cosier prospect for people. They're more welcoming. Now, I understand that the voluntary sector can be a more approachable set of organisations, and the Trussell Trust may well welcome people and talk to them about their problems in a way the state doesn't, in a way the job centres, job centres can't, for instance. But some of the other things um, that Adrian was talking about, this more than, more than food idea, the idea that, that you'll also get talked to about your relationship problems. Um, perhaps you're suffering from domestic violence. Um, perhaps you have mental health problems. Perhaps you need financial advice. All of these things suggest to me that you're not... There isn't an honest relationship there. You're going along and you're finding yourself being drawn into a relationship with the extended state via the Trussell Trust or via a similar food bank. It isn't unproblematic. There's something there which we could be uh, construed to be a, uh, a relationship which, which sucks you into um, a relationship with the state which isn't necessarily going to be a helpful one. And it may draw you away from those other resources that you, that you might otherwise draw upon. Which brings me to the second point. Um, somebody was kind of making the big society argument, I think, that the way society has changed is responsible for what's going on with food banks, that people, um, you know, the, the bowling alone arguments, that people aren't, members, aren't, aren't going to church, they, they aren't members of trade unions, they, don't, they, don't, they aren't members of political parties. You know, participation and community life has changed. And I, I think that, that you know, I, I kind of agree with that. I think that is a problem. And what's tended to happen is that that kind of discussion has been stuck in the voluntary sector itself. So um, there was a guy over here talking about the, uh, the cuts being behind this. There's a, something, something quite self-serving about that, because local authorities have, d have funded a lot of local organisations. And as local authorities have lost a third of their money, the voluntary sector is now feeling very vulnerable. There's a double dependency there. There's a dependency of the voluntary sector on the state, and there's a dependency of those individuals who go to the voluntary sector on them in turn. And I think there's a slight self-serving um, nature to the, the, the arguments that are being made in relation to that. When I talk about the big society, I'm talking about individuals and communities. I'm not talking about the organisations that are aligned with the state. Okay. Hannah, anything you'd like to yeah. come back on? Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a couple of uh, points. The first point was in relation to uh, the consensual measures of poverty that you were talking about, so our idea of poverty now uh, versus uh, previously. I, th I think with a lot of this it's where's your point of comparison you know we've we've had a real long historical look we've had a reference to the 70s but what's really interesting about um some of the recent consensual poverty studies is actually how it's changed or how people's ideas of what a minimum standard of living is has changed over the last 10 years and actually um the recent data that shows that people expect people to have much less well relatively less now than they did at the end of the 90s so that's really interesting i think the other point that was made about whether states should get involved, I think, is really, really interesting. I think this whole debate is inherently political, um, so we can't really get away from that. But I think there's another assumption that's being made, and particularly in reference to realism and things like that, that some of these, the way that the deficit's been handled is inevitable. But social policy analysis will show you that choices are being made and there is an inherent political economy going on here. So I think we need to ask our society more normative questions about what, what, we want, what we want to spend the money on and how we should do that. There is a question in terms of the state being involved, uh, some studies in Brazil where the state's got more and more involved in food banking there and to try and ensure more access and things like that. I personally think it's a, it's a question of outsourcing, that I think really the state should do more. The state shouldn't just get involved and, and sort of support a food charity. And um, the point about food waste I think is really important, and I've brought it up several times, and obviously Robin has. But when Robin said, made the point about waste making us, doesn't it make us think that we should organise our society differently? It doesn't make me think that. It makes me think that we should, our food system should be organised differently not that we should get more and more charitable organisations running around after the waste. Yeah. Um, if I could just... There's a very important point to make here, actually, which uh, I knew nothing about the food industry before I became involved with the, the food bank. I have found that people in the food industry have been, very, have been very willing to cooperate with us. Let me just explain something to you. Our biggest supplier is a company called Fresh Direct, it's a huge company. It's, it, well, it's, it's a large local company. It has got a turnover of about 200 million pounds a year, and it's uh, sited in Bicester. Now, this company um, imports food from all over the world and serves its customers. 
Um, it's a very efficient and well-run company, but the problem of surplus food in the food chain arises from this simple fact, which is that if you've got a 200 million pound turnover business, and you are serving X number of restaurants and hotels and food stores, matching supply and demand precisely is impossible. That if you, I don't know what, how many customers they have, let's say they've got 10,000 different customers. You imagine trying to predict next week exactly how many, uh, how many avocado pears you're gonna need, okay? Well, you're liable to be left some, with some on your shelves. And all the companies that we deal with, and we deal with this big company, but also Sainsbury's and Tesco and Waitrose and Aldi, we, we deal with them all. We, we collect food from their back stores, which they're going to throw away. The point is they're all up against the same thing. It's not that the food industry is some kind of wicked capitalist conspiracy that wishes to destroy food and leave people in food poverty. It really isn't like that. Okay. And the people in the industry, when, when, they, when we come and pick up their food, do you know, they've got smiles on their faces, the same as when we give the food away to the charities that we serve, they have smiles on their faces. And what I'd like to see is a system, I'm not talking about organizing society differently, I'm just saying that in this simple regard of waste food, there's a lot more at a practical level that we could do which would stop food being wasted and get it to those people in need. Okay, so I can take one or two points and then panellists, I'm coming back to you. The comments that government should do more and government should do more, it doesn't matter what you look at. Welfare benefits, a defence, government is enormously inefficient and wasteful. And, and I'm not sure it's governments that need to do these things, it's the whole of society needs to think of these problems. Okay. My name is Gideon, uh, I'm a North London student and I'm going to ask the panel in their final thoughts to come with some conclusion on one issue that I'm having. Are we going to support, I mean, Adrian's saying there's, a, there's coming to a million people that need support. Are we going to push and support for state intervention and actually say we need to withdraw money from other ongoings the government participate in, particularly perhaps international aid, because people can ask we need to prioritise our own people? Is that what the... Uh, panelists are pushing for and arguing for, or are we going for an attitude of actually it's about time that, of course, those that really need it should get it, but it's about time we increase education on food, we have a tougher stance, and we have no place for people who are going to spend their, uh, or the little money they have on scratch cards or any other of those sort of things. What's the panelist view on that? Audience, thank you very much. I'm going to come back to the panelists now in reverse order, so starting with Robin, not very much time, I'm afraid, maybe a minute and a half. Okay, um, well, uh, you've heard me at some length this morning speaking rather vehemently, so apologies if I have, a, if I have um, shown too much passion for this argument, but it's something which uh, I feel that, I think that we as a society do not value food sufficiently. I think that as the lady was speaking about, you know, the affordability of food in this country, I think food is very affordable in this country. And in a sense, it's almost too affordable, which is why we waste such huge amounts of it. So my first point is that I want to leave you with is this, that whilst there is food waste and people living uh, with not enough food in the country, that's a disgrace, and it's not something which is insoluble. It's merely a matter of local endeavor and local organization to bring those two things together. The second point, and my last final thing I want to say is this, that it's been raised a number of times by a number of questioners. It's the question of state involvement versus voluntary organizations. I think that a healthy society is one which encourages individual citizens to take individual initiatives to solve those problems in their local community. This is not the job of the state. The state cannot do it, and when it tries, it generally crushes local initiative, and you often end up with needless bureaucracy, needless expense, and a, a worse outcome. So the thing is that, that we as citizens must all feel energized to do things for ourselves and for our communities and not leave it 
to the agencies of the state. Robin, thank you. I never apologise for being passionate. That's what these debates should be. Um, Hannah, over to you. A couple of minutes. Yeah, brilliant. Well, just to respond quickly to a couple of things, I think the question of um, government doing more, I think there's an assumption often that, that by that, uh, myself and others, means spending on, on social security and other welfare state aspects, but that's not the case. Um, what I would argue for is actually more government role in terms of labour market policies, making sure work really does pay, um, and really being an, an kind of inspiration for change and progression really on some of these issues. You, drawing on creating policy frameworks where we all have a role to play. And really importantly, that we have a role to play in holding everybody to account as well. And I don't think, I think that is a role and that is something that we can do by holding people to account. That's not to say that we're not, we're not playing a role either. I think the question that was, that was, that was the issue that was raised about people not knowing how to cook and, and things like that. And, and this the point that Robin raised about, you know, as a society, we need to value food. I think that's absolutely, I think there's a, there's a really important point there about what our food system looks like, what a fair food system looks like, and a fair food system that's fair across the globe. But it's one that we all have to participate in, and we will all have to make, some of us will have to make sacrifices and in order to make sure that everyone has access to food. But I would really implore people when thinking about this not to think of it as the, a problem for poor people. And I really want to make that really, really clear. It's not about them not sort of, it's not about ignorance and things like that. It's about us all. So I guess the, the thing I'd leave you with is, is that, um, that we all need to think differently. But also that in this debate about food charity and thousands of people working really, really hard to meet urgent needs, we need to always remain focused on structures and systems as well, and the roles and responsibilities that everybody has to play. Um, the state, the food industry, corporations, private business, civil society, us as citizens, we all have important roles to play. Thank you, Hannah. Adrian. Well, yeah, I mean, I've I listened to a lot of your, uh, a lot of the questions and comments have been really good this morning. Thank you very much uh, for, for everyone. Um, I think, um, you know, there's been lots of questions over whether it's government responsibility, whether it's charity's responsibility, whether it's community's responsibility, whether people should take personal responsibility or whether we need a compassionate response uh, from the community to help people in crisis. See, I believe it's not an either or. I think it's a combination of both. I think everybody, as Hannah just said, needs to take responsibility to help meet a need where they see it. Um, and um, I mean, I put it to my children that, you know, what I, what I want them to be brought up in a world where they walk past a homeless person on the street and think, well, that's just the government's responsibility and abandon them and leave them. I, I, I would want my children to be brought up in a world where they walk past the homeless person on the street do something practical to help, sit down, listen to their story, show compassion, but at the same time go to policymakers and tell them that person's story so that they can make it less likely that people find themselves in that situation in the future. And that's what the Trussell Trust are trying to do. We're trying to talk to policymakers to tell the stories of those in crisis. It's unacceptable that people in 2014 are having to eat tissue paper to be able to make themselves feel hungry. That should not happen. And I don't believe the ultimate answer is to cut food waste because um, food waste is an absolutely important issue. And it is disgraceful that so much food gets wasted whilst people um, need food. But if we had a, a country where there was no food waste through our supermarkets, we will still see people in crisis that need help from food banks because there are people every day um, in our communities um, who are struggling to juggle between paying bills and putting food on the table. They have creditors knocking on their door saying that they need uh, payment on their loan. And that puts people in an incredibly stressful position. And when you're faced with um, court letters threatening charges, people are very likely to cut back on food themselves in order to make sure their children have something to eat. And at the moment, we see that one in five mums in the UK admit to regularly skipping meals to make sure their children eat. Um, so the government should be doing more to be able to understand these issues and to do something about it. But in the meantime, when we see a need, we will continue to um, work with communities to be able to respond to that need. Adrian, thank you. And finally, Dave. The supermarkets, I, th I think, are, are being um, uh, unfairly criticised here. They do support the, the, uh, yeah. the, the industry very much, and I, I think that needs to be recognised, that they do, without supermarkets, the food banks wouldn't exist. Um, also, I, there's a very strange argument that goes on and has been touched on uh, a little by, um, by Hannah, I think, um, about cheap and unhealthy food being a problem. 
First of all, I, I dispute that cheap food is a problem. Surely if we have a food poverty problem, the cheaper the food is, the better. Um, so you know, I think that I'd counter that one straight away. And also this notion that, that, that certain types of food are unhealthy, that there, are, there are arguments against that notion. I think you know, this has got more to do with a certain snobbishness, I think, and a certain middle class agenda about um, the kinds of food poor people eat, that they're getting fat on uh, processed and fast food. Um, and I think that's a very strange argument to make if you're also arguing that people are, are going hungry. Um, finally, there is a problem of poverty, and that has a lot to do with, with the um, uh, people going to food banks. There's also a problem of welfare changes and welfare reforms. I, I acknowledge all of that. But I think what we, ha what we really need to get to grips with is what's changed in society. Some of that is, as uh, Robin says, to do with um, people being, uh, becoming more reliant on the state, and, and their initiative is often crushed as a result of that. But I'd say the same for charity. Um, I don't think there's a great deal of difference between going to a food bank and going to, going to a job centre. If you collect your benefit or you collect your food parcel, both of those things uh, generate a level of dependency. I don't blame the individuals involved necessarily. What I'm looking at is what's changed culturally and why it is that people feel the need to do that rather than rely on the kinds of things and the kinds of um, uh, backups that they would have had in society in the past. Dave, thank you very much. Can we thank our panellists? Thank you.